Hola. Bueno, hola a todas y a todos, estamos en vivo. Eh, hola a todas y todos, eh, yo soy María José Fernández, parte de la organización de este evento, junto a Derechos de los Animales Marinos, Equipo Judicial Sandra, Activistas Animalistas de la Costa y Proyecto Algo Argentina, y Activistas Independientes. Eh, queríamos comunicarles que el evento no se va a poder realizar debido a que Lincoln ha tenido problemas técnicos para conectarse, eh, desconocemos realmente cuál es la causa, pero bueno, estuvimos esperando su presencia porque realmente nos parecía un aporte fundamental para nuestra lucha, que él pudiera aportar desde su experiencia la rehabilitación y liberación de los delfines eh, por parte de Dolphin Project, pero realmente, eh, bueno, vinimos acá a dar la cara y a decir que seguramente reprogramemos esta fecha para más adelante, porque para nosotros es muy importante su presencia, y eh, bueno, que, que hacía más de un mes que veníamos organizando este evento, que sepan también que lleva... Ay, disculpen, pero está entrando Lincoln o Barry en este momento. <ríe> lo vamos a admitir, lo vamos a admitir. Disculpen, sí. La última, por, borre, borre. Esto es en vivo, esto no, es más no, en vivo que esto no existe. Bueno, eh, Lincoln, are you there? Dali, no sé si querés saludarlo. Hello, Lincoln, welcome. Hello, sorry. Ok, don't worry, it's ok. Um, we are uh, on live on YouTube channel. Uh, we uh, are starting. Um, um, okay, we start. Let's begin. Good morning, good evening. Depends on where you are. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the second day of the International Congress about marine animal rights, specifically those who are in captivity. Today we have a very special guest who I will be presenting in a few minutes. But first, I would like to say that this live uh, will be in English language, but soon we will upload this uh, with Spanish subtitles. Este en vivo va a ser en inglés, pero pronto vamos a subirlo en este mismo canal de YouTube con subtítulos en español. I would like to briefly introduce our service for those who don't know us. Uh, my name is Dalila Lewis. And today I will be the presenter of DAM, an organization made up of several activist groups. We have joined the experience, strength and energy of Proyecto Galgo Argentina, Greyhound Project, um, who in 2016 have succeeded in creating law number 27330, which bans dog racing throughout Argentina turning this act into a criminal offense. They are currently working with other groups in South America um, to bring this ban to other countries. Uh, also, Activistas Animalistas de la Costa is a local group which I have founded, uh, whose main objective is uh, to spread about the problematic of aquariums. We seek with our activisms of awareness in the streets and at the gates of Mundo Marino and Aquarium Mar del Plata, the abolition of captivity and the end of marine shows. Also, the AM is composed by independent activists such as Carla, Paulo and Gerardo, who contribute with their knowledge and carry out the creative design and communication support of our website and YouTube channel. And Equipo Judicial Sandra, at least but not last, here they are, Dr. Maria Jose Fernandez and the Jude Elena Liberatori, who have some words for us. Hola, buena jornada. Mi nombre es María José Fernández, abogada y miembro de Equipo Judicial Sandra. Eh, fue fundado por la doctora Elena Liberatori, integrado asimismo por las doctoras Noelia Villarino, la antropóloga Lucía Guaymas y eh, Juan Martín Miraldo. Somos un equipo judicial que tuvo a su cargo la causa de amparo de la orangutana Sandra, quien a partir de la sentencia del 21 de octubre de 2015 fue el primer animal considerado jurídicamente persona no humana 
he eh, tomado en cuenta como ser sintiente a quien correspondía reconocerle su derecho a una vida digna y a una mejor calidad de vida que la que tenía en ese entonces en el zoológico de Buenos Aires donde se encontraba. En 26 de septiembre de 2019 se logró su traslado al Center for Great Apes en Florida, Estados Unidos, donde hoy vive en sí mi libertad. Agradecemos mucho la presencia de Lincoln O'Barry en este evento. Y le paso la palabra a la doctora Elena Liberatori. Uh, good evening, my name is Juan Martín Miraldo, and from Sandra Judiciary team, I will be performing the translations of, of, of the members of my team. So, hello, my name is Maria Jose Fernandez, I am a lawyer, part of the organization committee for this Congress. I'm also a member of the Sandra Judiciary team uh, that was founded by Judge Elena Liberatori. The team is also made up uh, of Dr. Nelia Villarino, the anthropologist Lucia Guaymas, and Juan Martin Miraldo. We are the judiciary team that was in charge of the legal case of, for the protection of Sandra, the orangutan, who, who became the first animal to be legally recognized as a, as a non-human person since the original ruling of October 21st, uh, 2015. Sandra was also recognized as a sentient being And that meant that for anyone who was taking care of her, they had to acknowledge her right to a dignified life and a better quality of life than the others she, than the one she had in captivity at the Buenos Aires Zoo. Her transfer was achieved uh, to the Center for Great Apes in Florida, USA, on September 26, 2019, where today she lives in semi-freedom with the possibility of carrying out uh, the typical behaviors of her species in a suitable habitat and sharing his life with Chitro, another orangutan. With the, the team, we carry out academic activism from the field of animal law in order to expand the rights of non-human rights. We greatly appreciate Lincoln's participation in this Congress and we welcome him. Sigo yo, no? <coughs> Buen día. Good morning for us, dear Lincoln. Estoy muy agradecida y conmovida de compartir esta segunda jornada del Encuentro por la Liberación de los Animales Marinos en Cautiverio y de conocer el trabajo enorme que hace Dolphin Project desde 1970. Quiero agradecer que haya seres humanos como Richard O'Barry y tú y que hoy día su hijo Lincoln continúe esta lucha interminable por la liberación animal y por la nueva relación de los humanos con ellos. Estamos buscando una nueva convivencia con los seres sintientes. Sabemos que lo que hacemos son granitos de arena en una playa, acaso gotas de mar, pero lejos de desanimarnos, nos da más fuerzas para seguir. Necesitamos cambios legislativos que admitan la sintiencia animal y el reconocimiento y la garantía legal de los derechos de los animales no humanos. Necesitamos que los funcionarios, la sociedad, las escuelas produzcan los cambios de los paradigmas antiguos de la cosificación y la tolerada violencia hacia los animales. Necesitamos cambios culturales en nuestros hábitos de ropa, alimentación, diversión que hagan posible la liberación animal. Por todo eso, Agradezco que podamos compartir esta jornada de activismo para solicitar el cierre del mundo marino y del acuario Mar del Plata y de todos los lugares de Argentina que tengan animales del mar en estanques indignos. Ninguna justificación que estos lugares infames argumentan son válidos, porque un delfín o una orca deja de ser ellos mismos en el momento que son apresados o esclavizados y esclavizados. Basta ya ahora. Gracias. I am very grateful and moved to share the second meeting dedicated to the release of marine animals in captivity, to learn about the huge work that the Dolphin Project has done since 1970. I am grateful that there are human beings like Richard O'Barry and that today his son Lincoln continues this endless struggle for animal liberation and for the new relationship between humans and them. We are looking for a new coexistence with sentient beings. We know that 
what we do are tiny grains of sun, grains of sun on a beach, perhaps even drops of sea, but far from discouraging us, it gives us more strength to continue. We need legislative change that admit animal sentience and the recognition and the legal guarantee of the rights of non-human animals. We need that officials among society as a whole, that in schools, we change the old paradigms, paradigms, paradigms sorry, of objectification and tolerated violence towards animals. We need cultural changes in our clothing, eating and entertainment habits that make animal liberation possible. For all this, I am grateful that we can share this day of activism to request the closure of Mundo Marino and Mar del Plata Aquarium and all the places in Argentina that have sea animals in captivity in unfit ponds. Any justification that these infamous places argue is, is not valid. Uh, because a dolphin or an orca ceases to be themselves the moment they are captured and enslaved. Enough is, is not, is enough is, is enough now. Great. So, um, what are the what is the aim of these uh, congresses? As it was mentioned, in Argentina there are two aquariums, both in the Buenos Aires Providence, in which dolphins, sea lions, seals, sea turtles shark, penguins, and orca live. Almost all the zoos in the country are closing down. There is a political will to move animals into sanctuaries. In fact, in the last two months, two elephants and 12 lions traveled to Brazil and the USA. There is a lot of information and awareness about land animal rights, but marine animals aren't included at all. People don't relate that an aquarium is as bad as a zoo. For these reasons, we created the Congresses to inform professionals, academics, students, and the public in general about these wonderful animals, their complexity, their culture, and why their rights must be recognized. The speakers from multiple disciplines around the world will be talking about the consequences of captivity shows. Um, on their experience in rehabilitation, releases, closure of aquariums, and legislation of their countries about marine animals. We want Argentina to know everything about the danger of aquariums because this year we are going to present a bill project banning marine animal shows at national level. Due to this, the importance of these congresses uh, and in educating people uh, about this issue. We are very happy to introduce you, our special guest, who will be telling us about the incredible work of Dolphin Project. Lincoln Obari is an executive producer, director, documentarist, activist, and the campaign coordinator of Dolphin Project. Lincoln Obari has worked with his father on adaptations and releases of captive dolphins in Colombia, Indonesia, Nicaragua, and the United States. Welcome, Lincoln. Greetings from Argentina. Hello, thank you for having me. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I don't know how, if, if everyone's an English speaker or not, and so I'll try to speak slowly as well. Um, you are I'll free pretty... to make all the time you want. Nobody will interrupt you. Okay, I will uh, make my, my talk will just be basically about um, specifically our campaign in um, Indonesia that we're doing right now, the Umalumba Dolphin Sanctuary. And um, here I'm gonna switch away from my face and we're gonna go on to, oh, can I, you gotta uh, make it so I can share my screen. It's yes. disabled. Yes, of course. Yep. Mm, let me see a moment. I think now you will be able to. Okay, so you guys can see my screen and I'll go to uh, Are you see, you're seeing my screen? Yes, yes, perfect. 
All right. So I'm going to talk about our Indonesian campaign, and this is our most current campaign, but um, these are just some of the projects that we've done historically going back to the 70s. And we've worked, like you said, we've worked in the US, we've worked in the Bahamas, Brazil, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Haiti, South Korea, and Indonesia. Um, there have been other readaptions and releases by a, some, a few other organizations, but I think we've pretty much kind of pioneered this work going back the longest period of time. Um, when we talk about readaption and release, those, those are two different things. All dolphins in captivity, unless they have a communicable disease, all dolphins that are in a captive facility can be readapted. And readapting is just the process of taking a dolphin from a concrete chlorinated pool and taking them to a seaside space where they can live in the ocean, feel the tides, the rhythms of the sea, see the sky. All dolphins that are in dolphinariums can do that then it's more on a case by case basis, whether they can be released or not. Um, but all dolphins are candidates for readaptation. <clears throat> this is the area I'm gonna be talking about today that we're working in Indonesia. And you can see on the bottom where it says Jakarta, that's Java. <clears throat> and just to the right of Java is a small island of Bali. And that's where I am right now. And that's where the uh, Dolphin Readaptation Center is. <clears throat> And like you said, um, you know, all animals, especially terrestrial animals, have sanctuaries. And it's pretty incredible that dolphins, being one of the highest, uh, I would say, animals on the evolutionary scale, are basically the last animal in captivity to get sanctuaries. There's sanctuaries for dogs, cats, rabbits, giraffes, elephants, lions, tigers, but Dolphins not, and I believe it's because dolphins are more profitable in captivity than any other animal in captivity. And so there's just been this major push by the captivity industry to not have sanctuaries because it's a threat to their bottom line and to their business model. Um, so the dolphins we currently have at the sanctuary, they started their life in the wild. They were captured from the wild. And originally their first bit in captivity, they were in the last traveling dolphin circus in the world, which was in Indonesia. I'm going to skip ahead real quick. So this is a typical dolphin show, but this is actually a traveling dolphin circus. So this is a temporary pool. The dolphins are driven around in a truck and come to a small village. They'll dig a hole, put this plastic liner up, put the bleachers up and a circus tent over it. And it'll be a dolphin show for a week. And they have a couple otters and they have a couple parrots that are trained and a bear. And then at the end of the day, capture the dolphins, put them back into the truck and move to the next town. So after they spent years in the traveling dolphin circus, they were then purchased by a hotel here called the Melka Hotel, and they converted all their swimming pools into dolphin pools. And 
it's built around a hotel and a lot of the guests would come and you could swim with the dolphins. They offer also offered what they call dolphin assisted therapy, which is a debunked uh, uh, therapy where, you know, they say you can get healed by swimming with the dolphins. <laughs> So it's just your typical dolphin show, and then here's where people could swim with them. And um, this is just a video of another facility. This is actually one that we helped close down that was uh, called Wake Dolphin. Um, but so the, what, the last slide was the Melka Hotel and it had just gone into disrepair and the hotel really wasn't opened anymore, but the dolphin show continued. Um, and working with our local partners here, the forestry department, we were able to uh, finally shut down the hotel and confiscate the dolphins. Um, you know, a lot of it is, it's through education. And so we did a lot, uh, you know, I've been in Bali working, I think I came here in 2010 and first saw them at the Melka Hotel and promised that I would come back and figure out how to get them out. And it took 10 years of tireless campaigning. You see we down at the bottom right, we had billboards all over the place on city highways. Um, we rented all the video screens at the airport. We did a traveling tour with a motorcycle club where we do these big dolphin aerial. Um, I rented all the video projector. Whoops, let me go back one. All the video screens at the airport for a few months where we play a video. We did, uh, this was probably one of the most successful things we did was working with street artists. There's a huge street art scene in Bali. And so we worked and probably did over a hundred murals with the hashtag free Bali dolphins. And um, these are just some of the murals that we did. So it was just doing everything we could to constantly make captivity unpopular and, and you know, it's once a dolphin area takes root, it's really hard to shut them down. And so the only way you can do it, it's supply and demand. And so it's just trying to get the public to stop buying tickets to dolphin shows. That's been our most effective way to, to end this. Um, we did puppet shows. Um, so the first thing we built was many years ago is we've identified an area in Indonesia where most of the dolphins were captured. And it was in Kerimunjawa National Park. And so immediately we built a sea pen in Kerimunjawa. That was our first rehabilitation center. And it, it probably sat there empty for seven years. We never had dolphins in it. But what it did do was it stopped the captures. Since we built this, this facility about eight, seven, eight years ago, there hasn't been another capture in Kerimunjawa because what was happening was whenever an aquarium here wanted dolphins, they would hire local fishermen and the local fishermen would catch the dolphins. And then they would radio into the authorities that they had accidentally caught a dolphin in their nets and they need the aquarium now to come rescue them. And so when we built our center, it stopped that because then, because we were partners with the government, if somebody accident, accidentally caught a dolphin, they would have to come to our facility. And so although we never got to readapt and release dolphins in this facility, it immediately stopped the captures. This is just us building it. And that was our original center in Kerry Munjawa. We called it Camp Lumba Lumba. Lumba Lumba means dolphins in Indonesian.
So it was, you know, quite a small investment to build this, you know, just a few thousand dollars, but it immediately stopped, you know, since then there's never been a capture of wild dolphins again, because by law, if they catch them, they would have to come here, not to an aquarium. So this is our center now here in Bali. And um, the dolphins we have now, we believe are all releasable. And so for, you know, what we had hoped to be very quick, you know, this process of readaptation to teach them to live back in the wild. Historically, when we've done this work, it takes anywhere from six weeks to four months it, from when we get them to when they're actually released. This type of facility would be perfect for that um, amount of time because of the pandemic. We've now had the dolphins for a, close to two years and we had never expected to do that. But when they locked everything down, they also forbid the release of animals because they didn't want people gathering and to release dolphins. You got to get a lot of people together and be in small places. So ideally a true sanctuary for dolphins, especially dolphins that may not be releasable, this floating sea pen would just be one component of it. The whole bay would be the actual sanctuary. The floating sea pen would just be where we would do medical work and where we would feed the dolphins. But ideally, and we're gonna, after we release these dolphins, we're gonna probably move this facility to a bay where we can actually net off the mouth of the bay and the dolphins have the entire bay to live out their lives and they just come here to eat and this is where the staff lives there's a small house there on the right we have 24-hour security um you can see as it spins around at the top there that's the mouth of the bay that leads out to the ocean we would look for a slightly smaller bay where we could actually run a net across we're in an area here where there's boats and boat traffic and so we can't net that off um and so you'll see on the bottom right there that's uh we have one two three large pens those are all actually connected by gates which the gates are for the three dolphins we have now are always open so they have those three different areas they can go to all the time um, the center one is about 20 meters deep so it's quite deep it's about 60 feet 20 meters the other two are about uh, about 10 meters deep. And then, are you seeing my arrow? Do you see my cursor or no? Yes, yes. Yeah. So where my cursor is here, this is something and I'll talk about it in a, a minute, but this is what we call the forging pen. And this, is a, this project's the first time we've introduced this new concept. Um, this pen, has a much finer netting. And so at night we hire fishermen and at night they come and they fill that up with live fish, specifically target species of fish that we know the dolphins would be, hunt in their normal environment. And in the morning we let the dolphins in there for about an hour and the dolphins actually feed themselves. They can chase the fish and the fish can't escape. Um, these other pools are full of fish, but it's not necessarily the kind that they would eat. But you'll see in a minute, I'll show you some underwater footage where you can see them swimming and there's just million, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fish. But um, this is just a sign, but I just wanted to show the sign because um, one of the things the resources we make available on our website is um, the protocol that we've helped develop over the past 50 years of doing this work. Um, we've actually written a protocol for releasing former captive and performing bottlenose dolphins back into the wild. And we give all that information away for free. But rule number one on the protocol is government cooperation. Unless you have a partnership and cooperation with the government, you're just spinning your wheels. You can't even go to the next steps. And in Indonesia, we really have a true partnership that we work with the Division of Forestry, the National Park here in Bali, the National Park in Kerimun Jawa, and then our local partners, which is Jakarta Animal Aid Network, and then, and then of course, us. And so, um, you know, working with the government, 
it cuts through a lot of the red tape that you'd have to go through and, um, you know, th different things they can make just, you know, they can make anything happen basically they're the government. And so, um, we've had this incredible partnership here that's allowed us to do this work. And, you know, diff there's different rules in different countries and in Indonesia, technically all animals in captivity or in the country are property of the forestry department. So uh, they can come at any time and confiscate animals. And so it, you know, in other countries, we've had to work with the court system and try to get dolphins wrangled away from places. And so, you know, there's different scenarios here. It's been a good, good partnership because they can actually go and just take the animals away whenever they want. And this is the day we actually came and got the dolphins from the Melka Hotel. And brought them first to our facility. And this was actually the moment that we, the dolphin, this is the first time that he's been in seawater in about 12 years. This is rocky. So yeah, this dolphin had not been in the ocean in 12 years. Let's see if I can go back. I think that was a video. And this is that moment he first got in the ocean again. It's kind of a sweet moment because you'll see them swim and see each other and then they kind of spin off into. A... And immediately this is when the healing starts because they now can feel the rhythms of the sea, you know, where they were before they had a roof over them so they couldn't even see just a simple thing like the sky or stars at night or you know the sounds of shrimp crackling and, and the tide going up and down and it's all those things. Um, you know, another thing, when we got there, it was very run down. And I think the filtration system had even was always broken. And because the filtration system was broken, they would just add more and more chlorine to the water. So the dolphins were very bleached out. And in the time that they've been with us now, they got their color back. They've gotten their weight back. You just see the difference, you know, here they are now at our facility you know, as opposed to a swimming pool. You know, the, the hardest part of this work is actually getting dolphins because once you get them in, into this environment, 30 million years of evolution kicks in. It's like, if you can teach a dolphin to jump through a hoop, you can teach a dolphin in just a matter of days to catch live fish again and, and to be a dolphin again. And so um, when we first brought them, we were hand feeding them the live fish. And this is before we came up with the idea of the foraging pen. Rookie. So we'd have them, you can see him catching the live fish right there. And you'll see his eye, it's a little damaged. He's not blind. But we believe uh, two of the dolphins have eyes like that. And we believe that's from their years in the traveling dolphin circus, probably being carried in a stretcher that was dry or didn't have a cutout for an eye. And the eye got scratched. And then this is just buildup of scarification over the eye. But um, we've done vision tests on them with, with their eyes that are damaged like this and they have full vision. So it's, it looks worse than it is. Um, this is just another picture of the current layout. Uh, let's see, where's my... So this is actually inside the forging pen. This is where we let them in for about an hour every day. And you'll see the fish schooling. And this is where they learn to hunt again and work as a team. We have three dolphins there now. One of them, uh, Johnny, we believe him to be over 30 years old. Um, the other two somewhere between 12 and possibly 15 years. 
And um, Johnny, who's the oldest, he was in a tank by himself for, I don't even know how long, eight years or something like that. And he's turned out to be the most dominant of the group. Even, I guess he's kind of the matriarch. And so a lot of times he'll be the one chasing these schooling fish and the other two dolphin will wait more in the center of the pool for him to push the school towards him. So it's really kind of interesting where he, although he was in isolation for so long, he's become the more dominant uh, uh, hunter. And that's again, you know, 30 million years of evolution kicking back in. Um, another component of our sanctuary is maybe about a quarter of a mile away or something, we rent some land and we built an education center because our facility is not open to the public. Um, because we are, all the dolphins we have currently are candidates to be released. A lot of the work that we do there is about breaking the bond between man and dolphin. And so we don't allow the general public in there um, just because we're trying to, we try to lessen who who's out there. But in a situation where dolphins are not releasable, there's probably a way to build like another platform away from the sanctuary, but we're people can view and see the dolphins and there's no show. They just see the dolphins being dolphins, but because we're going to release these dolphins, we don't allow anyone there. So we built an education center and we have uh, 70 full-time students that from the village and we teach them the, all the way from English to marine ecology and all about dolphins. And so the education is a big component of it. Um, this is actually a artist rendering. This is actually a look. This is a real location, but we've dropped our C pen into the middle of it. And um, we're currently looking at two more locations to build two more sanctuaries, one in Europe and one in North America. And um, so this is kind of just a conception of like the most, this would be, this is a fjord in Europe. And this would be the most ideal situation where you have a net running across and then the pen is just in the middle, but the dolphins would have access that that whole area. And the, the, the floating part would just be for feeding, for medical work, where the, the trainer security can live. And it doesn't have to be floating in the middle. It could be a dock coming off the beach. This is just a different, you know, we've done different scenarios and different layouts. This would be the most ideal for a permanent sanctuary. Something that's got this kind of shape, that's got, it's protected from big waves. It's protected from high winds. Um, and so we're always on the lookout. This is the one we found that may work for Europe. And I'm, I'm starting to, I'm gonna probably go in a few weeks and start looking in um, the Caribbean, Mexico and North America for a spot like this as well. And then, you know, for me, this is kind of the future. I don't know if you probably all have seen this video, but this is a, a robotic dolphin that was created by um, a company that they make a lot of animatronics for movies in the film industry. And they're two guys that used to work for Disney World as Imagineers. And they basically created this prototype for a dolphin. You know, the first one, it's cost them like $30 million. But as they make more, the price will come way down. And they're hoping to get aquariums as buyers for this. And, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, this wasn't possible, but with modern animatronics, with augmented reality, with virtual reality, with 3D technology, you don't need to have animals in captivity anymore. You can have a much more interactive experience, for instance, using virtual reality you know, places like SeaWorld could convert their whale stadium into a place where everyone puts on a headset and they, you know, on our website, we have a virtual reality movie about swimming with wild dolphins that I made probably for $10,000 US. You could go for less, you know, a 10th of the price of what an orca costs 
make an incredible documentary in virtual reality with wild whales and dolphins where it would put you into a pods of wild, you know, you're in the middle of the pod looking around and seeing you're, you're there. It, it would be so much more of a better experience and not have to actually use animals. And so for me, I think that's where the future of the, the animal display industry should go. Um, yeah, that's basically what I got for a, you know, a quick rundown of our Indonesia project and where I see the futures. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, amazing. Thank you so much. We have learned a lot. Um, and hopefully we will, those dolphins as well, we will, looks like hopefully we'll be releasing them sometime this uh, spring, early summer. So we're very close. <laughs> We've only been held up just because of the whole pandemic and the lockdown and everything, but uh, we're now we're really close. And one thing I didn't mention is that is, is the release and the post, the work after the release, when you release dolphins. Um, <clears throat> historically, we've always, for many years, done a freeze brand, which is kind of like a brand when you put on cows, but instead of using heat, we use liquid nitrogen. And we would put different symbols in the top of the dorsal fin and usually pass out flyers with that symbol, almost like a wanted poster to all the fishermen because the fishermen are the ones that are out at the sea and may will probably see the dolphins and we would get reports on how the dolphins are doing by that symbol. For many years, GPS technology was just too big. It was, you know, so cumbersome. You'd have to mount this giant thing onto a dolphin and it was just not respectful for the animal to do that. But technology has gotten so incredible now that, that um, the GPS devices are so small. It's literally maybe twice, maybe a little bit fatter than my lighter and just a little bit longer. And it'll amount to the dolphin's dorsal fin and just kind of like an earring that pulls out of your ear slowly. If you have a real heavy ear loop earring and it's pulling all the time and it eventually it'll come out, <clears throat> the GPS will actually fall off after about a year and the battery is good for about a year. And so after the release, we'll be able to go every morning onto a laptop and see exactly the area the dolphins are in and then take a chase boat to go out there and visually do an inspection every day. Um, just especially the first six to eight weeks is a very trying time because chances are when you let dolphins go, the, the first few weeks, they are going to go up to boats they're going to follow fishing boats they're going to go near people just because that's what they're used to and um we just want to make sure that we're monitoring them every day during that period which we can do so yeah that's all i got if you guys have any questions i'm happy to try to answer them perfect thank you so much um, um, I have some questions. Um, I don't know the rest of the equip, equipped. Eh, los demás tienen alguna pregunta. Eh, yo tengo una. Arranco. Okay. I I I'll do my question. Um, um, I don't know if you know that here in Argentina eh, we have an orca eh, who is a male orca, shamank. And yep. his, his mate uh, is a dolphin, a female dolphin called uh, Floppy. And you know that uh, Mundo Marino people uh, sell shamanx uh, sperm uh, to yep. uh, cells. And uh, they use uh, the dolphin to stimulate shamanx uh, in, in a sexual way. And uh, I think this is a terrible uh, for the, for their nature, uh, what do you think about uh, uh, these things that Mundo Marino people do to stimulate? Well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not uncommon. I mean, most of the places that are holding orcas are 
doing the same thing. They're extracting the semen and they're all, and they're trading because there's, you know, there's, it's so hard now to get an orca. The supply is very limited of places. Now you can go get a wild orca. So now they're all in, and you know, and the gene pools getting is so small that they have to trade with each other for breeding programs to make sure they to keep the genetics strong. They, they all do it. I mean, I haven't heard of the stimulating with the, you know, with the dolphin. dolphin, but you know, at SeaWorld, they, the trainers are the ones that stimulate the orca manually. So what is, you know, they're both bizarre. You know, all they're doing is creating freaks because these are animals now that are born in a concrete, you know, why, how, why in 2022 is a whale being born in a concrete tank? It's like, the whole thing is crazy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, and what we're trying to do, like, I think for a lot of people, like, especially after they saw Blackfish or they saw the Cove, there was this big rallying cry for empty the tanks, empty the tanks. And I don't think people are aware that like we've been doing this work for 50 years, readapting and releasing dolphins successfully back in the wild. For me, it's not a question if you can do it. What I'm trying to do now with our current um, sanctuary project is show that it can be done very cost effectively and very transparently. It doesn't take millions of dollars. Like I think I built that C pen probably you know, for a couple, it probably a couple hundred thousand dollars and did it probably. And I, I think we built it in a month once we knew we were going to have the dolphins and um, it, it's, you know, it doesn't take millions and millions and millions of dollars. It can be done very cost effectively and it should be very open and transparent all the work so that everyone can see. It's just like, if you go to our website, we wrote the protocol for how to do this, how to, from, from how to work with the government all the way on how to actually let the dolphins go. And we give that information for free because we don't want to have the monopoly on sanctuaries. We want to see countries all over the world doing this work as well. That it's so valuable, a valuable job. Um, another question from uh, the lawyer, Maria Jose Fernandez is that here in Argentina, a lot of people think that in the case if, uh, if Shamenx uh, could be rehabilitated and released, uh, he must go with his partner, uh, the dolphin uh, Floppy, because they have a kind of friendship. They think that they must go together. And if they, they, got, if they got separated, it could be bad for them. Is, that I would probably agree with because, um, you know, dolphins or anyone, any animal doesn't do well in isolation. And so, you know, to take that orca from, or, or take the dolphin out of that situation and put them you know, away and leave one alone could be bad. You know, you never know, but there's a good chance that it could be bad and dolphins can die from a you know a broken heart. It's like uh, they can just give up the will to live. You know, dolphins are not automatic breathers like humans are. For them, when they breathe, every breath is a conscious effort, and they can stop their lives at any moment. They can just not take the next breath, and so um, we see that happen in Japan sometimes in the nets. You know, before the dolphins are slaughtered, you'll see dolphins just go underwater and not come back up again. And it's, you know, they're seeing their family members killed. They probably know what's about to happen to them and they just give up on life and they literally die right before they're even harpooned. And so um, a depressed dolphin can be easily become a very sick dolphin and sick dolphins can go downhill and die very quickly. And so, you know, probably maybe keeping them together could be a good thing. You know, definitely they could be readapted, which would be mean finding a bay, netting it off, but then you have to spend time with them in that situation to determine if they are candidates to be released. Not all are candidates. Um, it's, you know, captivity does different things to different people and different animals. It's just like some people go to prison, they go to jail for 40 years and they walk out of jail after 40 years, like nothing happened. 
And there's some people that go to jail for two years and they lose their minds. And it's the same with dolphins. They're not all the same. And some didn't, some deal with captivity well and some don't. And so, um, but they're all candidates to be put into a natural sea pen and just least let, let them live out the rest of their lives with some dignity in the, the tide and the, the sun and live fish and just being dolphins. Um, here in Argentina, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, some uh, when it was uh, when someone tried to uh, make a project for Shameng to take uh, him uh, to a sea pen here uh, in the coast of Argentina, uh, some scientists say say that uh, he could uh, um, he could uh, be ill. Uh, and get um, I'm sorry um, that he could take he could bring some illnesses with him because he come from an anti-natural environment and he could pro uh, produce the deaths of other animals who were in nature he could but you know there's an easy blood test that you could just give him a test and determine does he have the virus or does he not have the virus because that's a simple thing piece of the business that could be answered right away. You have to understand like you're always going to get pushback from scientists or vets, but you also have to look at where those people have done their years of research. Like if, if you go to school and you, you love dolphins and you want to become a vet and help dolphins. Well, once you get, you become a vet, there's only one place in the world that you can get a job. It's working at a dolphinarium. Um, a lot of these researchers, the only access they have had doing research on dolphins is captivity, and they get their grants from the aquariums. The aquariums will fund research that most of the research is just to show to help perpetuate captivity. Um, and so you got to question where these people are, you know, what's their background and what is the, where are they getting their paycheck from? Um, you know, the, you know, even, even a dolphin born in captivity, although no, none dolphins that were born in like a concrete tank have ever been released. I wouldn't even rule it out because you're talking about an animal, you know, humans have been in our present body with our present brain size for like 20,000 years. Dolphins have a larger brain and more developed than humans. And they've been that way for 30 million years. So there's a long, lot of evolution there. And, and when you put dolphins back into the ocean, into a, a sanctuary setting, the evolution kicks right back in. They know how to hunt fish. They teach you, you know, especially if you have a dolphin that was born in captivity among with other dolphins that are from the wild, those wild dolphins will teach him how to hunt and how to be a wild dolphin. And so you know, of course, you, the scientists could say this could happen. Of course it could, but we don't know. We're at the infancy of releasing dolphins. We don't know it's going to happen. Um, you know, when, when, when we finally open the gates at our facility, we're not really releasing the dolphin. We're really giving them a choice. You know, if they decide not to leave, we're not like going to shoo them out of the pen work prepared to take care of them for the rest of their lives. Um, it's really their choice where they want to come and go. And if they want to come back at night and hang out, they can do that as well. But you know, the hope is that they swim away and we never see, you know, that's it. They're living out at the sea. Um, but you don't know yet, but you got to try. Yes, of you course. Say, uh, you know, it's like they say the same thing with Lolita here in Miami Seaquarium. They're like, oh, the transport would probably kill her, but there actually has never been one instance of an orca ever dying in transport. It's never happened. And they move, SeaWorld moves orcas from different parks all the time. It's routine piece of business, but you got to try. I mean, any situation that you put her in other than the aquarium is going to be better than where she is. So... Um. Great. Yes, it's your words are gold for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
And uh, is it more difficult to, to um, rehabilitate a dolphin who was born in captivity? Uh, here in Argentina, the majority of the dolphins are born in captivity. Well, they, like I said, they all can be readapted. They all can be put, even a dolphin born in a concrete tank can be put into a natural sea pen in a seaside sanctuary. Whether it can be released or not, it would really be a case by case basis. A dolphin born in a concrete tank has never been actually released in the wild, but I wouldn't rule it out. I don't, it's never been done. So there's no scientist or vet in the world that can say, no, it's not possible. It hasn't been done, so you don't know. And until you try, you don't know. And like my feeling is with the right dolphin and probably a dolphin would have to be with other dolphins that are born in the wild or had spent time in the wild that already know, you know, cause dolphins in different parts of the world have different hunting techniques. You know, there's dolphins like in Brazil where they drive the, do the fish towards the beach up onto the beach and corner them. There's dolphins in the Bahamas that go along the bottom with their sonar and find fish that are living under the sand. Um, they all have these different techniques that are learned over many generations. And so if you had the right captive do a dolphin that was born in the wild, that's in captivity, paired with a dolphin that was born in captivity, that dolphin that was from the wild originally knows those techniques and probably would be able to teach them. You know, there's a good chance. But until you do it, you just don't know, but it's worth a try because like, that's how you move forward. Yes, absolutely. We believe that. Um, and all that, uh, all the people who are here know, um, know uh, about uh, Tai Chi dolphins, but if someone uh, who is looking don't know anything about it, uh, what would you tell, what would you say to that person? If I was to describe what is Tai Chi? Uh, yeah, someone to, who doesn't know uh, currently well, Chi what's is, happening. Tai Chi is a, a place in Japan. It's a small village that is actually, that village is where modern whaling started in Japan. They've been whaling in that village, I think for close to 800 years. But um, somewhere right after World War II in the late 1950s, they started to hunt dolphins. So um, where whaling is very traditional in Japan and it's part of their culture, hunting dolphins is not. It only goes back to like 1958 and um, Basically in Taiji, there's a cove and part of the cove is, you, it, you, you can't see it, it's hidden by rocks. And so uh, every year, September through March is when uh, due to the currents and the water temperature that dolphins that are migrating, transient dolphins come close to the village. And so the boats will go out uh, it's about 12 boats, 13 boats go out and they look for the dolphins. And when they find them, the boats will arrange themselves in the shape of a horseshoe, like the letter U. And each boat has a long metal pole going into the water that they'll hit with a hammer. And the, with, in that U, they'll create a wall of sound and they'll get the dolphins in the middle of that and then drive them back to the village pushing them into this cove. And then when they get them in the cove, they have a net, they draw across and members of different aquariums and, and, and buyers will come and choose the best looking dolphins, usually young females. And then the rest of the dolphins are typically driven to the part of the cove you can't see and they're slaughtered. And the captive dolphins, they will move to some sea floating sea pens they have, and they'll give them just basic training. <clears throat> and those dolphins will sell anywhere from $30,000 to $125,000. Um, per dolphin. If a dolphin is slaughtered, its meat is worth about $500. 
And so you can see it's the captivity that drives the slaughter. If they were just killing them to eat them, there's not enough money involved for these people to, to waste their time. But when you can go out in one day and catch 10, 20, 30 dolphins for captivity, you're talking about millions of dollars potentially in one day that this small group of men, about 30, 40 men are sharing. And so it's the captivity is the economic underpin of this slaughter. And, you know, there was a, the movie, The Cove came out, it, it highlighted this hunt and, you know, immediately Japan came and said, this is our culture, but it's not their culture. It, it literally happened in the fifties and it's not the only place where they do a drive slaughter. Um, the original place that has been doing it for many hundreds of years is the Solomon Islands, which is next to Papua New Guinea, next to Indonesia. And there's uh, very indigenous tribes there that hunt dolphins and it's part of their culture. And they actually use the dolphin teeth as part of like a bride price, like a dowry when they get married. And the teeth are actually have a financial value like money. And my feeling is um, somewhere right after World War II or during the war, one of the biggest battles of World War II was fought in the Solomon Islands. And so I think either a Japanese soldier or a fisherman a couple of years after the war saw this village, the technique of how they go out in their canoes and they bang on rocks and create a wall of sound and drive the dolphins in. And they took that knowledge back to Taiji. I'm almost sure that's how they do it because um, it's the identical methods of dolphin hunting, this drive slaughter. Um, you know, in the Solomons, these guys are living in grass huts and going in one man canoes and driving the dolphins 30 miles from the ocean. In Japan, they're in their, you know, $200,000 boats and they get out of their boat and they hop in their Mercedes and they go to the grocery store. You know, it's a totally different, totally different thing. It's not a cultural or traditional thing in Japan. It's a very opportunistic, just money making thing. And, you know, Japan is the size of California, yet it has more dolphinariums than I think all of the United States. It has like something like 50 or 60 dolphinarium in Japan. And so many of the dolphins caught in Taiji are for the Japanese market. And the, many of the facilities are very poor conditions because they have an unlimited supply of dolphins. If a dolphin dies, they can just buy another one from Taiji. And because they're Japanese, they get a much better price. If the dolphin's going to be exported to the Arab Emirates or to China, then that's when you talk about the $130,000 per dolphin price. But locally, they probably pay, you know, somewhere maybe around twenty dollars or $30,000 for a dolphin in Japan. Well, I, I didn't know that part. Um, um, and here in Argentina, uh, we don't have professionals uh, like pets or marine biologists who wants to work with us against, um, against the industry of uh, captivity. But in the case of a sanctuary, what kind of professionals are needed uh, for the animals? For which part of the work? Uh, for um, do you need I mean do you need a scientist a bet uh... I didn't even graduate high school so I mean you just need dedicated people you don't need dedicated you know <laughs> that's what you need there's this is not like a magic trick or some like you know science you, you should all take the opportunity to go to our website and download the protocol you know, there's a little science involved, but it's mostly finesse. It's just being able to read the body language of the dolphin to know it. Are they a candidate for release? Are they not a candidate for release? You need someone that's worked with dolphins that can understand that. But, you know, um, it's good to have people that are on your team. Now, now, if you started a sanctuary and you actually were able to get dolphins, you're going to get marine biologists and people that are going to be coming to you, universities that are going to want to partner with you and work with you. It's just right now, you know, when you're a young person in college, the idea of becoming a marine biologist sounds very romantic. But the actuality is when you get that degree, where do you get a job? 
there, there, are, there is no, like every, most people I know that have a degree in marine biology are working in a restaurant waiting tables or attending bar because there are no jobs. And the few jobs that there are, are working at a dolphinarium or an aquarium. And so once you start doing that, and you start getting bills and it's paying your bills, it's like, you don't want to jeopardize that. So, but you know, we, it's like the same, we find that everywhere, but then once you actually get dolphins, people want come out of the woodwork and want to work with you and want to be partners with you. And like, cause that's of course the dream. Like most people, even dolphin trainers and vets, they care about the animals. They're just protecting their jobs, but they do care about the animals. And if there was a chance where they could be doing this work, actually letting dolphins go back in the wild, they would jump at that opportunity. Just and, right, right now it's not a real reality. So it's like, they just are like, okay, you know. The closure of aquarium doesn't mean that they uh, will, uh, that they won't have any job anymore because that is one of the right. things they tell us. And I see that, you know, there's parts of the world where captivity is becoming more unpopular, like, you know, France, Belgium. These are all countries in the, Greece that in the past few years, they're talking about outlawing altogether dolphin, you know. So there's going to be a great need for sanctuaries. I think that's the next frontier in this whole thing. And so there you're going to need dedicated people that, you know, know about dolphins to do that work, you know. When I closed the Melka Hotel, the day we came with the government to confiscate them, there was no warning. The, the aquarium didn't know, none of the people that worked there knew what was about to happen. And that day, I literally, I offered everyone that worked there from the dolphin trainers to the maintenance guy, the security, everyone, I hired everybody. That entire group of that worked at Melka now works for me and they would never work again with captive dolphins. You know, they're all basically reformed dolphin trainers. Great. And um, and the other the other uh, question is that um, uh, people here tell us um, if you rehabilitate or release an animal, it will uh, die immediately. Don't don't ask for that uh, because if they go go back to the sea, it will die. Uh, and say that uh, Keiko was a was an an unsuccessful unsuccessful uh, thing. Uh, we don't believe. I agree. That. I don't think I don't think Keiko was a success. Uh, yes. I don't yeah. think Keiko was a candidate to be released. I think if Keiko, if they had kept her in in the seaside sanctuary that she probably would still be alive today. I don't think, you know, I think there was a lot of politics involved with the people running that and, and um, yeah, I don't think she was a candidate and I think they were just too eager to try to release when that you just have to sometimes admit like this animal is not a candidate to be released. But I think she could have lived out the rest of her life and still be alive today if she was still living in a seaside sanctuary. But I mean, you know, animals are released back in the wild all the time. I mean, we do it, you know, on a daily basis, primates here are being released back in the wild. It's, it's a routine thing. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's really more, it's a case by case basis, whether a certain animal is a candidate or not to be released. Great. I think that we, um, I have no more questions. I don't know the rest of the people here. Uh, no? Okay. Um, I see things in the chat, but it's all in Spanish. So I don't know if that's people yes. asking questions. <laughs> Sorry, it was the, the question I have been um, done to you. Okay. Um, um, we want here to, um, sorry, I have, I have one more question. Sorry. Um, the problem here with uh, marine biologists and scientific is that we need them to, to take them to court, uh, to legal cases, uh, to um, name animals as non-human people. 
uh, like such as Sandra. And uh, to make that, we need uh, their, uh, their words, their statements. And that is the problem here in Argentina. Uh, we want marine animals to be recognized as non-human animals, but we don't have scientists who uh, to support us. You know that that they've that that um, angle has been attempted in many countries. Some countries have adopted that, and then other countries like the U.S. They didn't. They you know it just depends what country you're in and what judge you get and how you approach that case. And that's one angle, but that's not the angle. But that's just one angle. I've you know I've been as part of I don't know almost a dozen readaptation and releases and in no case where the animals declared non-human persons or anything like that. It was just, um, each one was slightly different, but most cases it was just making, you know, no one was buying tickets and the place just basically went out of bit went to shambles and went out of business. And then sometimes like in Brazil, we had to work with the courts to confiscate the dolphin. Other times like Indonesia, we worked with the government and they recognized that the dolphins were in trouble. They were being neglected. So we got them. It's just a case by case basis, but it's typically more working, trying to just drive the public away from the aquarium and make it unpopular. And I think we've reached that state, you know, um, we've been doing this work for 50 years and for most of my life, you know, when we go to a protest, it was just my dad or just two of us protesting. And people, you know, whenever we were written about in the newspaper, it would say like SeaWorld says and, and the o Dolphin Project accuses. It's like we were on the defense and they were on offense. But now because of the cove, because of Blackfish, it's reached this tipping point where now I think the majority of public perception is dolphins, keeping them in captivity is bad. And so, you know, when you have like Harry Styles saying, don't go to SeaWorld and you've got, you know, it's been, they've done episodes of South Park and the Simpsons and Family Guy have all done things making fun of dolphins in captivity. It's reached this tipping point where it's now part of public, um, it's just publicly accepted that dolphins don't belong in captivity. And it's like now suddenly we're on the offense and the aquariums are making excuses now why dolphins are still in captivity. They're on the defense. And it took, you know, 40 years of a lot of work to make that happen. But I think we've reached that tipping point. You know, and the politicians will do whatever they think the majority believes as well. So when you had blackfish come out, and there was a few months where it was trending on, you know, it was trending worldwide on social media and it's all everyone was talking about and all the celebrities were tweeting. Then you had politicians within a month coming out and saying, let's uh, like in California, no more captive breeding, no more trainers are allowed to ride on the backs of the whales because they just go with whatever they think is the popular thing at the moment. And so you just need, you know, a lot of it's timing and having a good documentary. And when that documentary is out, working quickly to get the public on your side, that you can get the politicians on your side. And then you can make things happen very quick. You know, a lot of it's timing. Of course. Um... Well, I hope you have uh, feel comfortable with us. It was such a pleasure to hear you. Uh, we are so, so happy to have you here and to, to spread uh, your, your experience uh, here in Argentina and in, via you two to other countries. And thank you so much. We are so, so grateful to you. Um, we want to, to give a special thanks also to Rachel or Carberry uh, to make this possible. And um, um, uh, this, uh, well, um, uh, thank you to everyone for, uh, for watching. Uh, remember to follow us on our social medias 
eh, Derechos Animales Marinos en Facebook, en Instagram y en YouTube channel. Eh, there you can find information about our activities and the future congresses. Eh, also, remember to follow, if you don't do it uh, yet, to follow uh, Dolphin Project social medias and the web page. Uh, it is uh, so important. Um, this live will be uploaded soon uh, with the Spanish subtitles. I remember that. And I don't know. I think that uh, we can. We, I don't. You know, one of, to I was going to say, if you look actually historically, especially the the projects that we've done releasing dolphins. If you looked at that first page I had, most of the projects were in South America, Colombia, Brazil, Guatemala, Nicaragua. The only one not on that list is Argentina. And so you guys have that in your favor that really South America for 40 years has led the way way before all these other countries in readapting and releasing and giving that chance. And so like you just need to use those case studies to make your to make your case to the government like, you know, basically the only one missing on the coast from that list is Argentina. Yes, of course. I, I, it is great to hear that. Uh, I, I think the same. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I see everybody in the next congresses uh, with another special guest. Uh, and remember that the only main characters here are the are the animals and their freedom. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know if you want to say anything else, Lincoln. Uh, or um, no, I mean, if you got any more questions, I'm happy to answer. I mean, I could talk all night. If you know. <laughs> yes, I don't want to take any, any more time in. from you. Congress uh, with another special guest. Uh, and remember that the only main characters here are the are the animals. Oops. Sorry, I don't know what was that. Um, okay, um, bye to everyone and thank you, Lincoln. Thank you a lot. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank thanks for having so this much. Congress. It's important. Yes, of course. Um, okay, um, hemos terminado y finalizamos. Los vemos a todos en el próximo Congreso y recuerden que pronto vamos a estar subiendo este mismo video con subtítulos para que todos puedan.